It's a book of Exodus, uh, chapter 20, verse 7. Do not use my name for evil purposes, for I, the Lord, your God, will punish anyone who misuses my name. Observe the Sabbath and keep it holy. You have six days in which to do your work, but the seventh day is a day of rest dedicated to me. On that day, no one is to work, neither you, your children, your slaves, your animals, nor your foreigners who live in your country. In six days, I, the Lord, made the earth, the sky, the sea, and everything in them, but on the seventh day I rested. That is why I, the Lord, blessed the Sabbath and, and made it holy. Thanks, Natasha. Of course, we've got up here the two stone tablets or representatives of the two stone tablets of the Ten Commandments that Moses brought back from God. And I, I, because Chris made them up last week and because he had them, I thought they'd be really good because we're looking at this subject in our family services um, at the moment. Now, afterwards, if you would like to come up and have a look, that's fine. If you want to test your muscles, you'll have to ask Chris whether he's happy for you to do that. Um, but um, these are fantastic. They were too good just to stick in a cupboard somewhere. So it's great. Thank you for, for sharing them with us today. Let's pray. Our God, we do thank you for your word. And we thank you that you are with us, that you long to teach us and help us to know more about who you are and how you have equipped us and empowered us to represent you in this day. And so we invite you to speak to us and not just that we would hear what you have to say, but we would put into practice what you are teaching us. That we might give you all glory, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, it's been a couple of months now since I spoke at our family service last, so I'm sure we've probably all forgotten, but I began to share about how we are ambassadors. We are representatives of the Lord Jesus to everybody that we know. We are living at a time, we're living in a country where very few people know God. Scott just shared that with us very clearly before. Many of them might know that God exists. They might know that other people believe in him, but they don't know who he is. They have a wrong understanding of him because they don't know God personally. Instead of knowing him as a loving, gracious, holy and just God who who invites and wants people to know him and to receive eternal life, their thought, their understanding of God is something quite different to that. And so we're saying it's really important that you and I, all of us as followers of Jesus, know God, know God really well, keep getting to know him so that we can represent him well to other people. We are his ambassadors. That's what an ambassador is. An ambassador is an official who represents the country or the kingdom or maybe even more importantly, the ruler of that kingdom to other people in other countries. And so if you're a Christian, then you're an ambassador, a representative, not just of any old king, but of the king of kings. And that's an amazing privilege and also quite a responsibility. And of course... We want to represent him well. But what we may not fully understand, and what I want us to understand, whether we're little, whether we're older, is how important it is that we do represent God well. There is a lot at stake for all of us. And I want us to take that seriously. Because this world needs us to represent Jesus well, the people in this world, our friends, our loved ones, our neighbours, our colleagues, our friends at school, even our enemies at school, they all need us to know God and to represent him well. And God wants us to do that. And he wants to empower us to do that. But we need to be willing to do that. You see, that's why he has called us his own that's why we are here for such a time as this. Every one of you are alive. And if you've put your faith in Jesus, every one of you belong to him and are called by him to represent him in the world today. That's a great privilege, 
but it's a great responsibility, isn't it? And it doesn't matter how little you are, how young you are, or how old you are, you have the opportunity. In fact, sometimes the youngest of us have an incredible ability um, to represent God to the people that we meet. And so that's what we're focusing on in this short series that we're doing in our family service. Last time, we looked at the first two of the Ten Commandments that are recorded for us in Exodus chapter 20. Now, you might not think that the Ten Commandments is the most obvious place that you would go in order to learn how to be God's ambassadors, Jesus' ambassadors. But actually, I think it's really, really helpful. You see, when the Israelites came out of Egypt and when they first became a nation, God gave them these Ten Commandments, well, not literally these ones, but the the things that were written on them, gave them these Ten Commandments to help them to understand how to live and how to honour God with their lives. If they broke one of the commandments, they were guilty of sin. God showed them a way how they could come to him and receive his forgiveness. But keeping those commandments, striving to keep those commandments was really important because doing that had a result that we don't often think about. Why do we want to obey God? Why do we want to follow God? I wonder if we ever think of these two reasons. We want to obey and follow God. We want to be faithful to Him. We want to keep and, 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 and be obedient to the things that He wants us to do um, because it enables, firstly, it enables God, well, for, for the Israelites, it enabled God to dwell among them as a nation. When they were faithful, when they kept the commandments, when they kept following the, the, the laws for atonement, that is, the way to, um, to pay the price or to atone for the wrong that they had done, God was able to dwell among them because he is holy and because um, he would ordinarily be separate, but because he gave them these commandments so that he could dwell among them. And in the same way, when we are living uh, obedient lives and faithful lives to God, he is present with us in a way that he simply can't be if we're going our own path. So that's the first one. But the second thing was that it helped the Israelites and it helps us to live as God's representatives to all the nations of the world. That was their calling. They were meant to represent God to the whole world. So too we are called to represent God in the world around about us. So being obedient to God and following him faithfully helps us to do that. So we want to be God's ambassadors. We want to be his representatives. And so it's important that we learn his commandments. Today, I want to briefly talk about the the number three and number four. And Natasha read for us out of verse seven. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Now, what's this talking about? Well, let me share a bit of a story. Some of you know I like to play tennis. Sometimes I'm playing a game of tennis and we're, having, we're hitting the ball backwards and, f- backwards and forwards on the tennis court and all of a sudden somebody's having a conversation with somebody else. Somebody begins to talk to Jesus on the tennis court. Well, actually it sounds like they're talking to Jesus on the tennis court, but really they're not, are they? What are they doing? They're swearing. They have missed a shot. They have messed it up. And they don't mind other people knowing how displeased they are. Well, when I hear people use the Lord's name as a swear word, that's uncomfortable for me because I know who Jesus is, right? And I expect it to be uncomfortable for you too. We know who he is. We know what he's done, uh, how, how, how wonderful he is and how loving he is towards us and particularly what he did in order that we might know God and have a relationship with him. So it's not nice to hear when somebody uses this wonderful name, the wonderful name of Jesus as a swear word. It shows they have no respect for Jesus, that they don't honour him. Well, that's bad enough, I guess. But what if a Christian did that? What if we did that? That's a whole lot worse, isn't it? Because we are representing him. If I did that on the tennis court, and those guys, most of them know that I love Jesus and I follow him. Certainly all my teammates do. 
and now most of the opposition do because I've been playing them for a, a couple of years. I say that I follow Jesus and yet I show no respect for him. That's terrible. Jesus' name is, his, his name is above all names. He's the King of kings, the Lord of lords. He's our creator. He is our saviour. How could we show such disrespect as to use his name as a swear word? So that's one way that we might be taking his name in vain. But I think it also speaks of more than simply this. Because it also goes to the way that we live our life. It's not just whether I use the name of Jesus as a swear word on the tennis court that will stand out to those guys in my, my team or even the opposition that I've got to know. It's my very character that will stand out as well. I'm a follower of Jesus. And we've already said, as his ambassadors, we are representing him to the world. So we should all want to represent him in such a way that people see that we are different, that Jesus is at work in our life. We know we want to represent him to others. Jesus told us to do that. He said to us in Matthew 10, everyone who acknowledges me publicly here on earth, I will acknowledge before my Father in heaven. So I don't mind telling people, I know that Jesus wants me to tell them at different times that I belong to him. It doesn't necessarily mean we all need to print up t-shirts, although there are some great ones out there, aren't there? But when the Spirit leads us, when the opportunity arises, we want to declare to people that Jesus is our Lord and Saviour and hopefully to be able to tell people why. That's the first part. But the second part of that follows naturally and that is because we carry his name, because we are his follower, we need to represent him well. We need to reflect to other people the difference that Jesus has made in our life. Is that easy to do at school? Is that easy to do in work? Is that easy to do on the sporting field? It's not always easy to do that. It takes practice and we're not always perfect in that. We need to understand that and when we mess up, then you know, we need to own up to that. But we want to work together. We want to help one another represent Jesus well. I wonder, and I need a little bit of help here, so I wonder, here's a chance for people to, to, to call back, and I'll repeat it, and we won't need to throw a microphone around, I'll repeat, but if you were to think of a word to describe a faithful follower of Jesus, that our friends, that our neighbours, that our colleagues um, spoke about us, that, and, and, and that word um, would, would, would show that, um, that we are reflecting Jesus to other people. What sort of words, I'm sure there's more than one word, what sort of words would come to mind? What sort of things do you think people, what, what do you think, Luke? Empathetic, Empathetic, caring, that's two words, mate. You're overstepping, but that's good. It's, um, it helps us to get that thought across. How good it is for people to, to say to that person, that's somebody who really cares, who really listens and really cares. Okay, so that gives us an idea. That's a good one, Luke. What else? What other words would we want to... Re to re yes, Barbara. Peaceful. Hey, that's a good one, especially in the world around today at the moment. There's not a lot of peaceful people, are there? But when, when we reflect the peace that only God can give, that, sh that sets us apart in many places, doesn't it? That's a good one. What else? Yep. Trustworthy. Trustworthy. Whoa, isn't that an important one? That really does set people apart. Yeah, trustworthy. Someone who is dependable. Someone who keeps their promises. Someone who keeps their word. Yeah, absolutely. What else? Anything else? I'm sure we can think of some others as we go along. Maybe we can talk about it a little bit later on. But that's a good example of the kind of people that we want to be, the kind of... Um, reflection of Jesus. You see, one of the best testimonies that I hear when I'm talking to people is when someone comes and declares they saw Jesus at work in someone they know and it caused them to want to search for and know Jesus for themselves. I reckon that's an amazing testimony. If they looked at, if people came to me and said, you know what, I've come to church here because I know 
this person that comes to church and I wanted to find out more about Jesus. How good would that be? That would be really great. There's the other side of that though, isn't there? The bad side is that one of the worst things that we hear is when people declare they're not interested in Jesus because somebody who say they are a Christian represents Jesus badly. Now, sometimes that's just used as an excuse. I get that. But still, we don't want that to be said of us. So honouring God, having reverence for him and his name, reflecting Jesus through our character, through our works, that's an important part of being an ambassador, representing Jesus to other people. We can do it when we go to school tomorrow. We can do it if we go to work tomorrow. We can do it when we're a part of our sporting club this week. We can do it wherever we go, just through our actions and our activities. And that's a part of keeping the commandments, the things that God wants us to do. Let's talk about one more as we finish up. What's the fourth commandment? It's a slightly longer passage, but I think it's a little bit even more straightforward in some regards. It says this in verse 8. Remember to observe the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. You have six days each week for your ordinary work, but the seventh day, the Sabbath day, is a day of rest dedicated to the Lord your God. On that day, no one in your household may do any work. This includes you, your sons and your daughters, your male and female servants, your livestock and any foreigners living among you. For, six, for in six days, this is a challenging verse, this one. For in six days, the Lord made the heavens, the earth, the sea and everything in them. But on the seventh day, he rested. That's why the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and set it apart as holy. Remember the Sabbath day was one of the commandments that God gave to the Israelites. Now, on our calendar, the Sabbath is a Saturday. It's not a Sunday. We tend to set aside Sunday to come aside for worship. Why is it that Christians mostly, not all, choose to come to church on a Sunday and keep that, often speak about it, even use the word Sabbath? Well, Christians have been wrestling with that question ever since the church was born 2,000 years ago. So let me clear up something very quickly. The Apostle Paul knew this problem that was going on and he was writing to a group of people who were struggling with a question a little bit like this. And he said, some people think that one day is more holy than another day, while others think every day is alike. You should each be fully convinced that whichever day you choose is acceptable. Those who choose choose to worship the Lord on a special day, do it to honour him. So what's Paul saying here? It seems that Paul is suggesting to say that it is right to meet, to worship on any day because no day is more special than any other. However, if you are convinced in your own mind that a particular day is special, if you think you need to do it on a Sunday, if you think you need to do it on a Sunday, if you think you need to do it on a Wednesday, then you should do that. Okay, whatever day you should choose, you should set aside, you should honour it by keeping, because God has made that day special. Now, there have been all sorts of questions about why it is that Christians generally have met throughout the last 2,000 years on Sundays. I'm not going to go through all of those, but I think the best reason that I've heard is that Sunday is the day that Jesus rose from the dead. It's a good reason as any to worship and to celebrate. It's also the first day of the week, and I like that idea as well. It's like we're giving him the start of the week, the first in our week, if you like. But let us not get so focused on which day we choose that we lose the point of what God wants us to understand. It doesn't matter whether it's Sunday or Saturday or Wednesday. There was to be a day of a week where each person set aside to worship and to rest because it was committed, it was dedicated to the Lord. It's a deliberate act of setting aside a day for worship and for rest. It's a little bit simpler, similar to something else we teach. We teach that every Christian, when they first get their income, should set aside an amount from that income to give to the Lord as an offering. It should be the first thing we do, not the last thing. He doesn't get what's left over. 
he gets the very first thing we do. The same thing applies to our service and to our worship. And it's easy for us to see how having this principle, this commandment in mind, helps us to be ambassadors of Jesus. Firstly, because God gives us that day of rest because he knows we need it in order for us to be at our best. If we keep working, if we're flat out week after week after week, we soon burn, soon burn out. We need regular rest in our life. And that's a simple, practical reason that we need to do it. But secondly, like I said before, is that God gets the first. He gets the very best of our time. He doesn't get what's left over. So regular time each week, not every second week, not once a month, not once every around about six weeks, as is often the practice for many people, not in this church, but in many places. If we do that, if we set aside that time, if we make that commitment to God, doesn't mean that, you know, if we're sick or whatever, we've got to drag ourselves in here. No, that's not what God means. But if we give him the first, then he will give us the fuel and the nourishment that we need and then together as a body as a church we can provide the support and the encouragement that the whole body that the whole church needs there are so many reasons why gathering regularly as the people of God is important and how God has given us this wonderful gift so that we can be at our best and to represent him well but the most important reason is what we are about to do now you see, the primary reason that we gather as the people of God in a place like this once a week is to come near to God. Our worship brings us close to Him through praise and through adoration, through the declaration. Our songs declare the truth of who God is, of what He has done, and of all He has promised. And it declares our response to that. We sing words of our response to Him in that. When we come and we open the Bible and read his word, it also brings us closer to God through instruction, through knowledge, through equipping us to be able to serve him well. But the third way I want to point to is particularly special because the third thing that I want to share with you in many ways is just being. It's just resting. It's a bit like that Sabbath, if you like. It's when we come to share around the Lord's table, around the communion table. There are so many good things about communion, many reasons to do this regularly. But the heart of it is just to gather, to be here in obedience. And what do we often say obedience is? Obedience is loving God. Obedience is loving God. That's how we express our love for God, by keeping his commandments. And his commandments are not burdensome, as we read in the first letter of John. So that's how we express our love for God through obedience. One of the things he told us to do is regularly take the bread and the cup in memory of Jesus until he returns. And so we do that. And whenever we do that, we glorify him. We're here in his presence. We fix our thoughts upon him. We remember him and we love him with all that we are and all that we can. And so if you love the Lord Jesus... If you've put your faith in him as your Lord and Savior, if you've confessed he is your Lord, then you are welcome. In fact, you are even commanded to come to this table or one of the many tables around the world. Whenever we do, eat the bread and drink the cup in memory of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're here for a very special reason. When we take the bread and the cup, we do some very important things things that are at the center of our belief and as of our life in Christ. We remember Jesus' death. We remember he wasn't killed, he wasn't overcome. He surrendered his life, he gave his life. His death demonstrates how much he loves us, how much he loves you. He said, greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. We also remember the bread and the cup reminds us of the forgiveness of our sin, keeping us from the punishment that should have been ours. Instead, Jesus took it upon himself. 
when we take the bread and the cup, we remember Jesus' resurrection. And like I said before, this is why Sunday is so special to us. And in a way, meeting and worshipping Jesus on this particular day, what does it do? It declares our faith that not only was Jesus raised from the dead, that so too, if we belong to him, we too will be raised with him. That's the declaration we make every time we take the bread and the cup. It says um, in 1 Corinthians 15, each one in his own order, Christ the first fruits, he was the first one raised from the dead and afterwards those who are Christ's at his coming, at his return. We remember the promises that Jesus has made to us. So many promises, way too many to list now. Except that we should always remember that God is faithful. He will keep all his promises. All his promises. How many people can you, do you know that keep all their promises? There's only one I know, and that is Jesus. But maybe the most special promise that we have to look forward to, is that, and that is the return of Jesus. There's nothing greater that we hold to than the knowledge that Jesus is coming back for us. He's coming back for all those who have turned and put their faith and their trust in him. And so whether we are alive at the time or whether we have fallen asleep beforehand, when that trumpet sounds and the voice of the archangel is heard, we will be gathered with him. So many promises, so many things to look forward to, so many things that this special meal represents. And so now in this precious time, if you love the Lord Jesus Christ, I invite you to take the bread Take the cup in remembrance of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Our Lord God, we thank you. Often we think of these commandments that we have been reflecting on as laws to keep us in line. And maybe that's what the enemy wants us to think. But help us to remember that each and every one of them are such a wonderful opportunity. That in seeking to obey you, first and foremost, we declare our love for you. In every step of obedience, it is an act of love. You have loved us so much, more than we deserve and more than we can possibly imagine, certainly in this life. And yet you have wonderfully given us an opportunity to very deliberately and very clearly express our love for you. And so help us and empower us to do that. Thank you too that these are commandments, these, these commandments and this obedience helps us to understand how you love to dwell with us and to be close to us. And that as we draw near to you, as we express our love and obedience, towards you so too your promise is that you come near to us as well thank you too that these commandments these simple acts whether it's just through setting aside that time each week and and saying and and putting that commitment that those that we know and love go do you know what that's sunday that is that is special that's the day that person goes to church that is a witness to people that we put you first. And so help us to bear witness to others in all that we do. Lord God, we love you. We thank you for all that you've done for us. Thank you for the, the bread and the cup that reminds us every time we come of the gift of eternal life that was possible because you came and paid a price that we could not pay. Lord, each of us know what it is to sin, to do the wrong thing. And I'm not sure that any of us fully understand the gulf or the chasm that that sin had caused between us and you. But we, what we do know is that it is only by that gift, that gracious gift that you gave to us, by taking the punishment upon yourself rather than us having to ca carry it. We won't know that separation like you did. 
because you have done that and taken care of it for us. And so we just come to worship you and thank you. And so as we take the bread and as we take this cup, help us to remember you faithfully. Help us to represent you faithfully as we go into this world, as we go and represent you as your ambassadors, as we go and encourage one another looking forward to that day when we are in your presence for all eternity. But before that day comes, we want to say thank you for this day, for what a privilege it is to represent you to others. And so I pray for each one here that as we go to school or to work, as we gather with friends or family, as we speak with strangers and neighbours, Help us to know that every single one of those encounters is an opportunity to represent you to people, whether it's through our character, whether it's the words that you give us to share. Help us to do that faithfully. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.